Okay, so we will be begin. Good morning, everyone. My name is Dan, better known as Tropic of Dan in the ocean science community. And welcome to the enthusiast portion of the FathomNet workshop. Now, I'm not just saying this because I'm an enthusiast, but I believe enthusiasts to be one of the most important groups working within the FathomNet project, because ultimately without as many eyes as possible on this data, we cannot truly scale up observations of life in the ocean in the way that FathomNet intends to, nor would we be able to really call this uh, a truly collective pot of knowledge. Next slide. So what exactly is an enthusiast? Well, we debated for some time as to whether this was an appropriate term. And as I mentioned, because we're trying to involve as many people as possible, um, it really is. And I'm being serious when I say an enthusiast can be really anyone who is interested in the ocean, what lives there, and what happens there. So an enthusiast might be someone who um, goes to an aquarium um, to see the animals there. An enthusiast might be an artist who loves incorporating ocean imagery into their artwork. Or an enthusiast might be someone who spends a lot of time preparing for and going on these black water dives. So not only can an enthusiast be someone from any educational or professional background, but an enthusiast might be at a different level from another enthusiast in terms of how they approach their interests. So um, one enthusiast might spend um, a lot of time watching ROV dives, but another enthusiast might be someone who is just starting to learn about the ocean and might you know, occasionally attend a presentation from like the Monterey Bay Aquarium um, to learn more. Um, so with that being said, um, with FathomNet, uh, we wanna make sure that enthusiasts can be involved in the level of comfort um, that they really want to be. And um, as far as how to do this is something that um, we'd like to brainstorm about uh, throughout the session. Next slide. So before we go any further, uh, we'd like to do a quick round of introductions to kind of highlight the, the varied backgrounds of what an enthusiast might be. Starting with myself, I'm from San Diego, California. My background um, is in film and cinematography. So kind of dealing with uh, imagery, like the, the imagery seen um, in the deep ocean um, is something that I can apply my background to. Um, and I'm actually currently a community college student about to graduate, hoping to transfer to UC San Diego in the Scripps Institutional Oceanography. Um, but at the moment, I currently don't have a degree, yet here I am talking about using artificial intelligence to explore the ocean. Um, so about two years ago, when I started pursuing oceanography, um, I discovered Schmidt Ocean Institute's ROV dive live streams. Um, what was unique about this was the level of interaction between um, participants in the YouTube chat, and um, they were able to directly communicate with the science team aboard RV Falcor. We'll talk a little bit more about these unique interactions here in a little bit, um, but because I wanted to replicate that kind of experience, I founded the Livestream Oceanographic Community in which we continue um, to interact with marine scientists in an effort to better understand what's being seen on these ROV dives. Um, so I'm not sure if Jeff is here, but if he is, I'd like to turn it over to him for an introduction. Hey, <clears throat> excuse me. Hey, I'm Jeff. Everybody hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, so um, as Dan mentioned, we're all from different levels of uh, expertise and educational and professional backgrounds. Um, I'm actually a software engineer in my day job, but uh, I've always been interested in uh, odd deep sea animals. I think ever since I saw uh, an episode of The Living Planet, like uh, posted by David Attenborough back when I was a kid. Um, I wasn't more actively interested in uh, and involved in this community until about uh, last summer when um, I knew there were live uh, live streamed ROV dives, but I'd never really kind of uh, fully dipped my toe into that pool until um, I'm on Twitter a lot. And uh, one particular member of the community, uh, the Unknown Explorer, uh, her name's Lisa, would always tweet these notifications every time a uh, dive went up. And I noticed one day that she linked to a Discord server. And I was like, hey, is this public? Can I actually join this? And uh, that's how I got introduced to Livestream Oceanographic and sort of the immediate community around deep sea dives. And uh, just kind of went um, 
deeper into it from there, like learning all the different organisms. And I got really interested in deep sea cephalopods. And eventually, uh, it's gotten to the point where I just like I tag scientists on Twitter and email Mike Vecchio when I have questions. And yeah, that's that's kind of my how it goes for me. Thanks, Jeff. And then we've provided a video from Davina, who unfortunately can't make it because she's on the other side of the world in Australia. So we'll uh, present her video right now. Erin, I'm actually not hearing anything. Yes, I can hear it. Um, hmm. We should He's have some time if you want to spend a few minutes um, to figure it out. Um, He's speaking kind of quietly. Um, it does I have the volume up. Okay, there it goes. And she okay. teaches inside the child, moving from being obsessed with whales to moving on to octopus, uh, and then to now deep sea uh, creatures and deep sea environments. Um, I discovered my first live stream a few years ago and I used to leave them running in the background while I worked um, and just got used to hearing the scientists talk in the background and got more and more uh, interested, more and more able to recognize the organisms um, and learning their actual scientific names and the differences between them. And that led me to joining the live stream oceanographic community so I could learn from others and then discuss the fascinating world that we were seeing in the dives. Okay, so you might have to be unmuted for a video. Um, oh, got it. But we'll continue. Um, so because this is a, a smaller group, um, this might actually be really easy. Uh, but we kind of want to take this time to know how you became an enthusiast or why you've decided to label yourself as an enthusiast as opposed to a taxonomist or a programmer, because we know there's a lot of overlap and some people uh, wish they could have been involved in every group. Um, so if you'd like to, you can unmute yourself, introduce yourself, um, tell us what your background is, if you have a, an actual community as well to support your interests. And then we can also start thinking about how enthusiasts can work together on a project like FathomNet. So anyone can feel free to unmute themselves and introduce yourself if you'd like to. Hi, I can go first. My name is Leanne. I'm a scientist. I work for NOAA right now, and I, um, my background is in coral ecology, but now I'm working um, with fisheries. I labeled myself as an enthusiast because I'm sort I, I kind of fall into multiple groups, but none at the same time. I'm very interested in using these tools and, um, yeah, I guess that's it. <laughs> Thanks, Leon. I can go next. Hi, uh, my name is Amanda Whitmire. I'm actually the librarian at Hopkins Marine Station, which is Stanford's Marine Biology Field Research Station in Pacific Grove. We're right next door to the aquarium. Um, uh, my background is actually in oceanography, and I didn't become a librarian until about six years ago. But um, I put myself in the enthusiast category mostly because I'd really like to build a community of practice around FathomNet here at the Marine Station, but also among other marine science librarians and try and get their respective communities engaged. So um, I'm here to learn how to get involved. Thanks. Thank you, Amanda. Hey, I'm happy to go. Um, I'm Grant and I'm from South Africa. Um, I work for a company called the South African Environmental Observation Network. And there I'm a marine technician slash biodiversity scientist um, working with offshore camera equipment. And I labeled myself as an enthusiast because um, I just have this huge backlog of, of images that I would like to go through. And at the moment we're just doing it manually and it just seems like an impossible task. It's just me and another colleague doing it and we just can't get through anything. So yeah, I'd like to, I would like to work on work with work with you guys so we can actually get through that using AI and um, FathomNet. Thank you, Grant.
Hey, I guess I'll go next. Uh, this is Derek Sowers. I'm with NOAA Ocean Exploration. I'm an expedition coordinator. So primarily doing uh, mapping and ROV work on NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer. And uh, yeah, a lot of the video data we collect from ROV, um, this tool is really exciting um, application of that type of data set. Um, so I'm interested in joining this group to learn more about how other users might interact with our data sets and, and add a lot of value to it. Thanks. Thank you, Derek. Hey, my name is Matt Dornbeck. I'm a colleague of Derek's at NOAA Ocean Exploration. And um, we, we do a lot of things within ocean exploration. So we're kind of jacks of all trades. So in, in essence, we are enthusiasts because we're not programmers. We're not taxonomists, uh, but we, we, have, we dabble in all of these things. Um, and so um, this is really exciting to me. I, I didn't even know there was a, a Discord channel for this, this stuff. So I'm already learning things that I'm excited to uh, take back to with me um, and uh, hopefully uh, contribute to the community. So uh, yeah, excited to see where this goes. That's awesome. Thanks, Matt. And um, in the interest of time, we'll continue, but I just want to say uh, thanks to uh, some of the marine scientists and people who do have a professional background in ocean science for joining. I know that a lot of marine scientists, um, their enthusiasm is what keeps them going. And also I know a lot of marine scientists um, are looking to engage uh, with enthusiasts and especially in the hopes that an enthusiast might um, find themselves on the path to having a professional career uh, in ocean science. So we'll continue to the next slide. So we'll start off with how have enthusiasts uh, interacted with ocean science in the past? So a brief background, um, and especially because this is something that I'm mostly involved in, are these ROV dive live streams. And thanks to telepresence, um, this has now allowed for audiences around the world to watch ROV dives. And this kind of began uh, with Dr. Bob Ballard um, of Ocean Exploration Trust um, and the core of exploration with his Jason project when he uh, projected images from uh, these ROV dives um, to audiences of children and educators who wanted to learn more about our planet. Now this has evolved over time. And of course, we all know that Nautilus Live is one of the most popular ROV dive live streams um, today. And now we have um, several different organizations that do the same thing. For instance, the Schmidt Ocean Institute um, with their ROV Sebastian, and of course, um, as some of our uh, participants know, with NOAA's Okeanos Explore. Now, this not only generates enthusiasm for ocean science, but it also has become a pathway for enthusiasts to engage in ocean science of their own, and we'll talk about that in the next few slides. And it, of course, has connected ocean scientists with the public, as we're kind of doing right now. Next slide. So um, how are some enthusiasts uh, interacting with ocean science? Well, in the past, um, through YouTube chat, Schmidt Ocean Institute, as I've mentioned, has their public chat enabled during ROV.live streams. So this has allowed for participants to directly interact with scientists. Um, on the right-hand side, we have a, a screenshot from one of these YouTube chats. And as you can see, um, you might recognize some familiar names, Dr. Uh, Mike Vecchione, um, from NOAA, who's working at the Smithsonian right now, um, is providing his input, as well as George Matsumoto from Anbari. But this is the common environment that enthusiasts can find themselves in during an ROV dive live stream. And on the left, we have an example of the unknown explorer. Um, also, uh, her name is Lisa, but she's provided some screenshots from a Nautilus live ROV dive. And she's um, put this out to Jeremy Horowitz who is an expert on black corals. And as you can see, Lisa uh, knows that it's a black coral and it's kind of confirmed by Jeremy and his response on Twitter. But one of the issues that uh, we've been finding is that a lot of this information um, is being put out there, but it's not going anywhere. It's either left behind or it's kind of forgotten. So with FathomNet, we're hoping to take these kinds of interactions and put them somewhere where it can be valued um, by a marine scientist or a taxonomist. Next slide. So we have a quick example here. This was on Schmidt Ocean Institute's um, dive 457 during the Designing the Future 2 expedition last August, in which I provided um, 
input as to our identification of this jelly, Alacraeus, and it was acknowledged by Dr. Brennan Phillips on board uh, the RV Falcor while it was off the coast of Southern California. So we'll kind of play this as to show an example as how this kind of interaction occurs. That's spot on. I see that in chat. Yeah, look at time. So this kind of happens a lot and um, it's interesting because as an enthusiast, um, it has kind of led me uh, to where I am right now speaking to you about FathomNet because Kakani was on this expedition and she was already starting to think, how can we uh, better engage enthusiasts with the FathomNet project? So for an enthusiast, uh, it could be an awesome networking opportunity. And for ocean scientists, it's a way um, to gain information from someone um, who is not a marine scientist. Next slide. So there are limitations. Um, for instance, uh, data available for deep sea annotation might belong um, to a specific institution or lab, and that access might be um, kind of uh, locked away to those who only belong to that institution. And of course, you can't just contribute other groups' data um, to a repository, and we'll kind of get into this um, in the presentation later on. Um, and there's limited access to these video streams, like for instance, um, Schmidt Ocean Institute does have the 4K footage, um, but right now we only have access uh, to lower quality footage on YouTube. And then sometimes the, the dives aren't even available after they live stream, so that information kind of gets lost. Next slide. So with these limitations in mind and everything that we're doing, what are we doing right now to kind of work around um, some of the hurdles that uh, might be um, involved as far as enthusiasts uh, contributing to ocean science. So for one, we've self-organized. As I've mentioned, um, we have the live stream oceanographic discord where we kind of continue uh, that interaction um, outside of YouTube. Um, and there we're able to share individual knowledge. And what we found is that enthusiasts will kind of group towards what they're most enthusiastic about. For instance, um, Jeff Day, who introduced himself earlier, um, is really into cephalopods, and he's way more knowledgeable about cephalopods than I am. So what we find is that when we do come across a cephalopod in an ROV dog live stream, we'll know that Jeff it will probably uh, be able to help out with an identification. And of course, we have conversations, as I've mentioned, outside of these live streams, and there's an alignment of uh, individual goals and interests despite us having so many different backgrounds. Um, and then uh, how are we resourceful? How do we um, uh, approach this without having that kind of access a marine scientist might have? Well, we kind of just scrounge up uh, what's available to us uh, throughout the internet. Um, and Bari has an amazing uh, deep sea guide that they've provided. And we find PDFs like this Davidson Seamount taxonomic guide. And then of course there's uh, Noah's Benthic identification guide, um, which even uh, the scientists aboard Okeanos Explorer use as they're um, performing these ROV dives. And then on Twitter, um, we have the ability to ask marine scientists directly about um, an identification. We have the Discord. And then, as I just said, we can ask scientists directly. Next slide. So here's a list of some of these existing groups. Um, I can provide an invite uh, in the chat while Erin is presenting her portion, um, but we do have the Discord and anyone is free to join and you can share that link with anyone else who might be interested. Um, and then I don't know if we have any Blackwater divers amongst us, um, but you've probably seen these amazing photographs of creatures um, at night. I provided some examples here um, from Ale Alexander Semenov. Um, and we also have the Okeanos Speedux YouTube who has actually taken the time uh, to upload past Okeanos Explorer dives full length. Um, so in a way, it has become an enthusiast library 
of Okeanos Explorer Dime so that we can go back and kind of see anything that might have been missed by a marine scientist. And if you want to put it in the chat or mention later on in the breakout session, what are some of the groups that you're involved in, especially if it's on a more enthusiast level? Next slide. And as you might have seen yesterday, FathomNet is also creating groups and resources. Again, we have the YouTube channel um, on Twitter. Um, we're also creating a Twitter bot. That'll be really cool. Um, there's the Slack space and the GitHub where you can provide feedback and ideas. Next slide. So enthusiast involvement is uh, very unique because uh, unlike uh, terrestrial um, citizen science um, with iNaturalist, someone can't just simply go on a hike um, and, and take a photo of an ocean animal. Um, so really when it comes to FathomNet, we're going to have to, to bridge the communities between ocean scientists, enthusiasts, and technologists because an enthusiast doesn't have the, the time, the money, or the resources to be able to make observations in the ocean. So that's why um, we're developing tools that will hopefully enable enthusiasts uh, to be involved in something like this at the level that they're most comfortable with. And for this part of the presentation, I'm going to give it over to Aaron Butler of Sea Vision AI, who is involved in uh, creating these uh, array of tools. All right. Well, thanks, Dan, and thanks, everyone. Hi. Um, so, yeah, currently we have technology um, starting to bridge these communities, and I'm going to describe those. So have you, as you've heard about FathomNet, it's a website and a data collection. You've been hearing about it during this conference. Um, it's an ecosystem of resources available in beta. This has been live since September. So it's not really been an incredibly long time. We're still at the beginning. Um, the team continues to plan how we can get to 1.0. And this workshop is part of that. The team is gathering feedback on how to make the fuller picture of FathomNet a reality. What we do know is that a lot of what we're working on requires more people and more data. The long-term goal of FathomNet is to get over a thousand fully annotated images per marine species of animalia. That's 200 million images and lots of annotations. Currently, FathomNet is seeded with three very reputable sources, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute's FARS database, National Geographic Society, NGS, Deep Sea Camera System, and National Oceanic and Amer Atmospheric Administration's ROV Deep Discoverer. Even with this information, we still don't have the courage for the extent of concepts that we're aiming for. We have about 1,441 concepts in FathomNet right now. That's less than 1% of the 200K ocean animalia defined in the worms database. The good news is that now these expertly annotated images that took years to gather are now available and publicly usable from a single source. The FathomNet API allows direct access to that data <laughs> and the website allows you to do a search and download a group of image results for a specific type of animal, specific, specific region, or you can go into a picture, an individual picture and download it from there. This is just the perfect ground for innovation to take place. And for the ocean and technology enthusiasts alike to contribute to science. And we really hope it's inspiring to these communities. It's a huge accomplishment. Data sets like these have the potential to build artificial intelligence models. This can help us define the ocean, but the quality of data matters. The better the data, the better those models will be. And that brings me to our next bridge technology, Tater. So we have Dan, Davina, Jeff, and other enthusiasts registered right now as Tater users making annotations on the NOAA Okeanos Explorer expeditions that we have uploaded in our NOAA capstone project on Tater. Also, uh, Tater was used as a staging area for the NGS data before it went into FathomNet, so the current seed data that's there now. 
As a bridge technology, let me just tell you a little bit more about this tool and how it fits in to the pipeline of how enthusiasts can put data into FathomNet. So Tater is a web platform for analyzing image and video collections taken from the website. It takes care of a lot of things that make working with video difficult so you can focus on the thing that matters most, turning videos into information. Now, Ben talked a lot about this yesterday. Uh, Tater has features like frame accurate video playback, enabling annotations by optimizing large videos that otherwise would be cumbersome to work with, as well as AI assisted annotation and the ability to apply AI within the system. And a really cool thing about Tater is that it's open source. And this may be a call out, so maybe the budding programmers in the group, if you are there, um, but there is a ton of documentation on Tater.io for users, developers, administrators on how to set this up to work with local video. You don't even need cloud storage or to utilize the Python tool um, and the REST API to manage your data. If you're interested in just, so this is a picture of the documentation, but if you're interested in just seeing the UI itself, you could go to taterapp.com and you can continue as a guest and you can look around. There's a public project called FathomNet and you can go in and you can just see how um, data is organized in there. You won't be able to annotate or edit anything. So don't worry, you won't mess anything up, but um, just you can go ahead and look around in Tater App. But another opportunity we have is that if you are interested in contributing like Dan, Jack, Davina, um, we have a sign up form where you can sign up and we will add you, um, at, we'll add an account for you to the same project. Um, and if you do want to become an annotator, there's lots of resources. Of course, we've said it a few times, but the live stream oceanographic um, discord group that Dan has, um, there's a lot of people there and the people that are annotating. So I would go on there and you can ask questions. Um, this video was showed yesterday. This is um, Carol Ann Stone from the University of Dallas. She's a student that's been annotating on, on the same set of data um, and her annotations as well will be working towards going into FathomNet. Um, everything that she covers in this video is also on Tater.io. Um, I would look in the user guide under annotation and you'll find everything she's covering here as well. So let me just share um, the link to this form real quick in the chat if you're interested. All right, so let's talk more about the annotation and how that fits into this. So we're adding users. We have the NOAA data within Tater and users are adding annotation. Um, so if you haven't used an annotation tool before or weren't at the talk yesterday, the most basic use of this tool is drawing a box around a part of an image that you're interested in entering information about. So these rectangular localizations drawn on the images or bounding boxes define the region of interest and the description contains the data associated with it. This can be created on a number of annotation tools. The most important part is that the output contains the minimum data required for FathomNet. Um, and the enthusiasts in there that right now are, um, so this is a video um, that Jeff annotated of, uh, of a squid because Jeff is a squid guy. Um, and it's just an amazing thing to see. Um, but the enthusiasts that are in there right now, they're naming animals to the lowest taxonomic hierarchy with their, that they can with the utmost confidence. They're also annotating any associated animals in the images with the tightest bonding box they can. And they're relying on using um, different versions, different layers so that they can collaborate on the animals they know the most about, like I mentioned send the squids to Jeff. Next slide. So where are we in the pipeline now? So after we have all the annotations, 
um, and they are on the videos, we have another step. FathomNet accepts um, images. So what we're annotating right now with enthusiasts is videos. So there's a step in between where we use the Tater Python tools to extract the frames. So we have still images, the parts of the videos with the animals in them. Those extracted images will make up a new public project where each of those frames will have a publicly accessible URL. This is the process we did with NGS and there's a blog post on it in the um, FathomNet medium. So it tells this whole story. And with multiple people in there annotating, we might need a checkpoint in between to ensure the data is ready to go into FathomNet. And once it goes into FathomNet, there's one more verification by export, experts before it is considered published. This is just to ensure that the data is the highest quality because that's our goal. The way the data is saved right now for the Tater annotations is really easy to export um, into a CSV file that FathomNet can ingest. Um, in this export tool, if you can see it, the top fields here um, show the most the, the required columns for the CSV file. And then there's a lot of optional columns that it will try to map to if you have it in your data, like timestamp or temperature. On Medium, um, Brian from Mbari wrote about all the things that you need um, in this export file. And I know this is later in the pipeline, but I wanted to share it because I built this export tool and it's really simple. Any annotation tool can build something like this into its system. And currently that I'm aware of, um, Tater is the only annotation tool besides Mbari's FARS annotation tool um, that has FathomNet in mind. So there's still work to be done. We have some outstanding questions. We can keep collecting data to scale out observations by one by one creating accounts for people. But what we're really excited about is the ways we can scale this in the future. We need to figure out how we can do this to reach our goal. How do we define better pathways for data, develop protocols to ensure quality, provide attribution to contributors, make ocean science more accessible by increasing outreach? So that's what you have to figure out. And so in the next slides, I'm gonna discuss the future and there are a lot of questions in here. So, um, and there's probably a lot of questions we even haven't considered. So just a reminder, if you have any feedback, it's really valuable, valuable to hear from you, put it in the chat or put it in one of the shared docs from the agenda. But also remember, we're gonna be brainstorming soon. So just take notes. Okay, future pipelines for contributions. What will this look like? We know that users need access to data, more tools to e more easily engage with that data, better integrations with the current tools, better defined protocols for annotation and clear pathways for review. We need to organize data based on user level so that users can get to the data that they can annotate to their, that, and that they're knowledgeable about. And we just need more ways in general for enthusiasts and scientist groups to work together. So maybe the pipeline starts to look a little bit like this, where we don't just have Tater, we have more tools that interface with FathomNet. We have many more vid image and video libraries that are becoming publicly access accessible and hosted for annotation. And we increase the structure around the review process. So no annotations are sitting there in a queue and never making it into the database. Another idea we have for the future and something that's come out of our conversation with enthusiasts like Dan involves meeting people where they are right now. So there are people creating information from live streams, right? How can we capture that? What if the live streams could be put inside an annotation tool and within that same framework, the annotations could be made and saved immediately? What if there was a messaging feature as well? So that collaboration that we saw earlier is happening within this annotation tool and all that data could be saved together. What else could we bring into this tool to make it more useful? 
And if enthusiasts are working hard to create this data, how can we recognize that? Can each user be given an identifier that's attached to the data? So anytime that data is reused in a paper or it becomes a foundation for some other technology that the reference can come back to recognize the people who created it. Like how DOIs track research paper citations, an org ID identifies people involved with research. Maybe we could integrate this somehow. We would love to be able to track people's contributions over time in the best way we can. If this data was used to locate a new species, maybe you would even get to name it. So attribution is important, not only to credit users, but also allow them to see that impact, to quantify that impact. How can we do that? What metrics can we collect to do this? How many annotations are made? What types are made? How long they've been a user? And what should be publicly available? Um, how do people want to see their impact? What do they want to share with others? And in the future, we hope that those sideline enthusiasts can jump into the game. We want to offer mentoring and education opportunities, opportunities to engage as a partner in science. We hope that this, as this grows, current enthusiasts can contribute more and will stay involved longer. And when newcomers see that contribution and impact, they'll be encouraged to give it a try. Creating and enriching these pipelines that we've been talking about will be part of increasing the networks and the ocean life communities involved with them. And as these communities grow, what other things will we need to consider? Maybe we'll have new problems, like how to get the information to the right people. Would some type of alerting and messaging system facilitate that type of communication? Last, and this is a fun question, maybe my favorite, how can gaming play a part? So the FathomNet team has a lot of unverified data created as output from machine learning models that could be reviewed by humans. Similar to how if you're completing a form online, you've ever used those recaptures, it says, is this a sidewalk? Is this a car? Is this a bike? This type of thing done with enough volume can have a lot of impact. How can we make a game that would be interested to the newcomers and the enthusiasts who are already participating? We're exploring all those typical gaming concepts, leaderboards and things like that, but what would you like to see? And that's it. Those are the ideas that we put together for the future. And we'd love to hear yours. Um, we have a few minutes now. So I think uh, me and Dan could probably take any questions. I haven't been paying attention to the chat. So if there's been any questions there, um, we can kind of look to those. Um, but yeah, thank you guys. Thank you so much, Aaron. Um, really quickly, I just wanted to clarify a specific limitation with ROV dive live streams is that even though we're capturing these screenshots and video recordings outside of um, Tater, um, you can't simply upload a screenshot into FathomNet because of course, for example, um, that is the, the rights are with Schmidt Ocean Institute or NOAA or MBARI. So that's where Tater um, is coming into play as far as ROV dive live streams. And that's where we really need to bridge the communities because if we can get Schmidt Ocean Institute or um, any other organization um, involved, then enthusiasts can start annotating um, the ROV footage that we're so accustomed to. But I'm also mentioning this um, because for uh, example, um, Grant mentions that he has a ton of images um, that he's acquired. If you have uh, created these observations yourself, then it is a lot easier um, to put that into something like FathomNet. So for even a blackwater diver, those images that they're taking, they own the rights. And so therefore, um, they can just easily put it into FathomNet. But for the ROV dive live streams, that's why um, Tater is so important as a tool. Um, but yes, we can uh, take some questions now at this time, if you guys have any. Hi, 
Hi, Dan. Uh, my name's Nick Bingham. I'm with Schmidt Ocean, actually. And I was just uh, thinking about the comments you were making. And we're really excited to see the big group of enthusiasts on the live stream and elsewhere. And we're absolutely committed to capturing all the annotations and the kind of work you guys do. And so there's a few ways we're working on this. We're working directly with C-Vision on uh, some integrations of our video. Um, we're also working on, so for any historical things that have been captured, anything in the past few years has a timestamp in the bottom of the video. So it should be able to look directly to our database to get the 4K imagery and stuff for that if you want to revisit any historical stuff. And uh, moving forwards, we're also looking into uh, better integrations with Tata and other annotation software, like you were saying, to be able to capture this kind of stuff, including in real time. It's a real challenge because, uh, as you know from watching the YouTube live stream, our actual real time link is not guaranteed because it's subject to all the satellite issues we have on the ship. Um, so we're ma making different systems that kind of cross over. So you'll be able to record your annotations in real time, but still make sure that we can access the highest quality video and associate it with that. Um, all of these things. So uh, great to hear all you, all the stuff you guys are working on today and look forward to close that gap uh, better as we move forwards. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Nick, for uh, joining and sharing that with us. Um, I'm sure that would excite a lot of people, especially since um, we're pretty familiar with uh, Schmidt Ocean's ROV dives and uh, Schmidt Ocean, of course, has made so many amazing observations. So to get that into FathomNet, um, would be pretty awesome. So thank you again. Amanda, I see you have your hand up. Thanks. I just um, sort of an observation as, as a person who's new to, to thinking about making annotations in Fathom that I've, I've watched lots of live streams because I'm a dork like you all. Um, but uh, I think a huge barrier for entry to me is I don't, I don't know what anything is, right? And so I think that something that iNaturalist and Merlin Bird ID does really well is, you know, you have an image and they show you a bunch and they say, well, it could be these. Does it look like any of these, right? And so I think if, if Tater or some other annotation interface, I could draw a box and then Fathomnet could do its thing and then pull up some like, okay, well, here's five other things that look like that. Is it one of those? I have no idea what level of development is involved in that kind of functionality, but I think that would really lower the barrier to entry for folks who want to get involved and start tagging things. But I can, I can answer that one. I mean, you're kind of, uh, <clears throat> I was hoping to have something like that ready for this workshop, but wasn't quite ready. But we are working with a number of researchers, some of them who were involved in kind of the early eBird Merlin stuff to do exactly stuff like that. Yeah, exactly. Like Jack said, quick query learning and that kind of stuff. So um, if you've ever used um, uh, Viame, it has a tool that is similar to in nature to something like that's called iterative query learning um, that doesn't exactly just use pre-made models but allows you to do make your kind of own model for stuff like that so similar in nature we are looking at leaning towards making stuff where you can exactly do exactly that draw a box and, and maybe not get an exact label but here's you know five things that look visually similar and kind of start you along the way and that will be tied in with like Ambari's deep sea guide or you know the NOAA ID guide and so that is um you know on our list of things to do for this year and make integrations with Fathomnet and Tater and um, stuff like that so uh, good good uh good thought and yes we we would love to see that too <laughs> and then I just wanted to add a little bit on there uh, while that's in the works um I do want to reinforce that um for enthusiasts um, it's perfectly okay if you don't know exactly uh, what something is. Um, as Aaron kind of mentioned, um, it's okay to identify something to basically what your knowledge is. I mean, as the example showed, Lisa um, only knew that it was a black coral, or sometimes we know that it's a siphonophore, um, but uh, nothing beyond that. And that's where um, kind of the building community is going to be so important. Um, because we can have a, a place where we can go to other people and, and kind of have that discussion and, and kind of start working towards getting uh, a better identification. And then again, that's why it will be important to have uh, the taxonomist aboard um, so that they can, uh, you know, provide their input and verification.
so to kind of build off that, oops, sorry, realizing my camera is off. Um, there is several different kinds of also like citizen science tools and things um, that have been developed that um, maybe could be an expanded to include such things. Um, we talked about a lot of gaming just recently that Aaron mentioned now. Um, and I'm wondering if some ideas have been explored. There's programs such as NemoNet and Zooniverse that have been already established and they incorporate a lot of citizen science. And NemoNet is slightly more advanced in the fact that it looks like an actual game where you identify things and it has then a list of like even subject to everything from coral to sponge to fish to as depending on your expertise level you can get down to further integration higher level of identification so I'm just wondering if that's something that's actually can be also used and then incorporated into something not just with FathomNet but also used within Tater and different levels of of that essence should I take that <laughs> Uh, so I see Kakati here. So I'm like, I'm ready. No, so I thank you for, for that. And that is something that we have really spent a lot of time thinking about and evaluating. So for instance, there's this group, um, was it Massive Multiplayer Online Science? So they're a group of individuals based out of Europe, right, that are developing like data interaction modules that can get integrated into massive multiplayer online video games, right? Zooniverse is, you know, it's a fantastic tool, but you know, it, it the way they they do engagement, it, it's 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 not a gamified system. And what's amazing about these MMOS systems or these multiplayer, uh, these massive multiplayer online systems, these are communities, gaming communities that have been around for years and sustain interest over time. And so that's that's one of the things that we're actually actively involved in. So we've, we're working with Internet of Elephants, which is a game development group based out of Kenya. They've done a lot of work with, um, you know, image data from camera traps and trying to create data interactions that way. And so what we're trying to do is not only create data interactions for enthusiasts to, you know, either verify machine generated, uh, you know, predictions or, you know, other either going up or down the taxonomic tree, depending on the the expertise level or the difficulty level. Uh, we are trying not only integrate something like that into an existing video game, we're also talking about integrating this at museum exhibits or aquarium exhibits, right, as ways to capture more users or potential players that could eventually come into what we're calling the FathomNet network. So I don't want to get into it too much now because I'll talk about that at the end, but that's a really great point and that's something that we've been looking at. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, I just, it came across because NemoNet is a huge effort that was developed um, by NASA and, um, or like individuals, a lab at NASA. And it, I just found it really interesting um, in order to kind of also incorporate because they have that multiplayer online um, game version and they've incorporated a lot of these different features. And actually the main person that developed it is now a professor at my alma mater. And so it was really interesting to kind of see how it all came together and that NemoNet is actually still um, quite engaging to a lot of people. So it's it, it created like this foundational gaming factor where people were able to draw their own boxes around um, organisms or elements and then being able to identify them based off their expertise level. So um, it laid out, I think, a lot of the groundwork for these kinds of multiplayer um, discords and, and gaming factors. So really interesting overall. And I'm, I'm, I hope to see that Fathom that can uh, incorporate a lot of that too. Derek? Yeah, I guess I, I had a question for people that know more about um, where the bottlenecks are kind of in this, this uh, emerging scenario. So, I mean, is, uh, is the help needed more on like helping Tater identify um, boxes around features of interest, like refining that, or is it, it's doing a good job at that, but then um, sort of narrowing down um, what the possible taxonomy is, um, or is it getting from a course taxonomy that maybe a non-expert could do to like a, fi a final quality controlled taxonomy that's actually ready for entry into FathomNet? Like just kind of wondering where those different sort of, um, pinch points are that we need to really focus on? Well, you highlighted all of them. <laughs> <laughs> but 
Ben has a couple of things to add about that. I, I was just going to say that, I mean, the, the bottleneck to date, like, for, for this group has really just been kind of connecting this community with even the ability to do something like that. So when you say, you know, Tater's ability or FathomNet's ability to do that, you know, I, I want to kind of clarify the differences that like Tater and FathomNet are, are platforms and they have algorithms that are integrated into them, some of which can do that kind of stuff. But, you know, it's one thing to have an algorithm do that and then be able to contribute to FathomNet. But what we're trying to do is recognize that you know, the the capability of algorithms to do everything or all the things that we need to do is just so, you know, nascent, like it needs all of this data. And, and there's just so many more uses for that data that, you know, that Dan and Aaron did a really great job of kind of going over that we want to connect more people to that data to really kind of explore different ways of using it, different ways of interacting it, aside from just, just that stuff. So, you know, as Kakani said, yes, those are all bottlenecks and they're all things that we're working towards, um, but they're kind of in parallel to the, you know, bringing more people into the interaction space. And I'd like to add a comment as well, and this kind of um, also uh, relates to what Emily was saying about um, thinking one thing was something, but it's actually another. Um, Tater is separate from FathomNet, so, um, and everyone has their own layer um, that they can work with in Tater. So that gives um, us an opportunity to, to have that scenario where an expert can come in and verify all of these things before it gets exported into something like FathomNet. Yeah, just to follow up on what, what Emily said, that, that's exactly what we did with the University of Dallas uh, um, educator group um, about a year ago or now. so now, where people who annotated the NOAA's capstone expedition for the musician seamount had actually used vars as it turns out to to do that stuff and they had made timestamps uh, uh observations but without localizations so we took those and did exactly what you said we put them in the tater seeks to the exact frame and had the students then draw the boxes so they actually knew what they were looking for and that that thing was in the frame they just had it was kind of a where's waldo at that point right which is which is a very useful thing and there is a huge catalog of observations that exist like that that just need to be kind of enriched where people you know may not have the ability to go down to the species but if they know what they're looking for they can find it and match it in the in the screen and all of a sudden now we have an enriched data set yeah the amount of data of so many different varieties camera qualities the way is it was stored is ridiculous I'd like to add, though, with that diversity, Emily, that's that's really important um, to not be uh, tunnel visioned into like side view of an ROV, you know, because soon AUVs may be the dominant source and they're all going to be looking down on things. So we have to think of all these different sources, too. So it gets tricky. Um, but working with NOAA OER, um, we uh, yeah, we have a we have a plethora of data. Uh, we have a lot of data in CTube right now um, that hasn't been localized. And, um, that, um, yeah, th that's that's the next step is really getting those for mm -hmm. us is to get those localized to help with initiatives like I that. I did a bit of well, kind of an enthusiast that's happened to have done a bit of this. Um, my undergrad project was related to stuff this, and it was using the camera on the ROV was interlaced. So it had really jaggery edges, which destroyed the model because it thought fish had massive zigzaggy faces, which didn't work for idea yet because fish don't have giant spikes coming out of the pair heads. So the number of, it, yeah, it's, it's quite insane the number of different methods we have to collect data. Yeah, that's you've highlighted both a strength and a weakness right computer vision can be very powerful but can also be very fragile uh and and so you know humans have this amazing ability to generalize and you know that's really what we want to kind of harness here is that energy and ability to do stuff and so I, i've seen a lot of, a couple comments about people wanting to engage in a, a scenario like the one that you just described emily so it sounds like we have another potential project on our hands where we can find some more 
uh, video or image sets where we can, you know, give people annotations that they just have to enrich. And I, I'm aware of a number of different uh, of those, and and we actually have a, a pipeline into more NOAA OER data uh, from specifically from Capstone, as it turns out, where we could start uh, opening that up to people. So I, I think I think that's something that would be, you know, useful for us to to highlight is that we can start to make more of those uh, available for people if they want to kind of dip their toes in or kind of go a little slowly without having to uh, worry about their own observations. And then hopefully, I mean, ideally, you know, the, the we don't have like a specific ability to kind of like have threads within Tater yet. But, um, you know, if you hop on the Discord or something like that, we do have the ability for people to kind of say, here's a link to an observation I made. Is this right? Can someone review this? And, and that's really where, you know, the community aspect of this that we're trying to foster can start to really take off is, you know, people feeding off of each other and doing that kind of stuff really, really can help uh, people learn and, you know, uh, generate high quality data a lot, a lot quicker. I had a quick question from what Matt was mentioning about CTube. Is there essentially a way that um, the CTube is a, is a manual version of being able to um, annotate organisms and, and different kinds of features on the seafloor? And I was wondering, is there like an export version that can then be introduced into the Tater or something that then um, helps train the algorithm? Is that something that's being used? We, we well, I can't speak for, for for Matt, but we have done a parallel live broadcast of a recent Okeanos Explorer cruise, and we are looking at how we can kind of start to compare and contrast observations made in one platform with the other. Um, it, it's kind of an ongoing thing, um, but I, I don't know if Matt has any more insight into specifically that. Um, yeah, I remember that demo. That was, that was really nice, uh, Ben. And um, I, I think to your question, Kim, um, it, the export from CTube to um, Tater would be pretty similar to what their work with the capstone data would be like, where um, the annotators did a really thorough job um, annotating the, the Hawaiian area. Um, and then in, in uh, VARS, which is Mbari's uh, annotation tool, and then exported that out. It got ingested by Tater, um, and and then the the students uh, were able to use that as the baseline for their for their annotations going that way. So it, I think it would be a pretty similar workflow. Cool. Thanks. And I should say that you know. Communication maybe has not been our strong point up, up until now for a lot of this stuff. But now that we kind of have, you know, FathomNet and Discord and a number of these communities, if you kind of, um, you know, just kind of keep track of them there, that's where we'll probably start posting any updates or opportunities for stuff like that as we move forward, as well as, you know, I'm sure is if and when we partner with NOAA more, they'll probably release resources on, you know, their, their sites as well. I think there's a big opportunity there, Ben, to be better communicators about this <laughs> from all of us. So yeah, um, yeah, no, I, uh, it's it's never been my. I'm an engineer. Uh, I don't. I, I talk to numbers, not to people. So sorry. <laughs> I was raised by engineers. So I, I feel you. <laughs> um, I just had a, a thought on. Uh, we talked earlier about like all these different comments being kind of <laughs> through all these different avenues that aren't really being captured and fed back into like a knowledge base. I was thinking like it does really matter. Um, I'd rather see like one really good tool that uh, you know users are excited to use and they get kind of rewarded for using. And then there's a, a really strong quality control. So like most of those observations are actually getting ultimately into FathomNet than having like you know, five different ways to gather observations and not have a bunch of them be kind of questionable quality or a lot more work for somebody to verify that the um, identifications are correct. So just, I guess, a thought on that, um, where we invest 
limited time and resources in this moving this forward? Yeah, that's. I mean, it's an interesting tension, right? Uh, there's a lot of different tools that you know a lot of people you know can be passionate about their workflows, uh, especially from a, like a professional standpoint. Um, and so we, what we don't want to say is like, there is only one way to do this. And then you've all of a sudden narrowed the community of people that you can, you can do that. But I definitely sympathize with that. And so one of the things that, you know, uh, keep that in mind for the brainstorming session, which really, you know, we're, this session is ending in, in two minutes, but, you know, figuring out a way to have a process where the data that goes into FathomNet, which is really meant to be that one place with correct QA, QC data and the different pathways that we can do, that we can get there without, like you said, basically just scattering everyone's attention and then get nothing good that goes into there. So that is an open question. Um, and it is, again, that balance between having, you know, that one thing versus that one thing not working for everyone. From an enthusiast standpoint, I do agree with you, Derek. Um, and during the early stages of experimenting um, with the idea that we can annotate, we did experiment with Biggle and found that it was kind of hard to use as an enthusiast. So that's where Ben came in with Tater. And um, so since we're still brainstorming these ideas, I personally think that for at least the enthusiast group, I think that we should advertise uh, Tater as uh, the kind of uh, go-to annotation tool, at least uh, for enthusiasts. I obviously am biased in that regard, so I will refrain from adding my comments. Yeah, I guess a follow up thought is like we wouldn't need to necessarily like squash enthusiasm for like, you know, people watching a live stream on YouTube and commenting like we could, but we could say, hey, if you're if this is engaging to you and you like trying to figure out what these creatures are, like here's another tool that we can point you to to like kind of up your level and it might be more rewarding for you to use that. So it's like it's still a way to get people interested and engaged, but you know, might not be the right tool to actually capture comments. And, and actually, uh, one of the ideas that we do have is uh, perhaps the ability um, to kind of export um, like from an overlay on a YouTube video. So that way you're still watching uh, the ROE dive live streams, um, but also having an ability to export data into Tater or FathomNet from there as well. Yeah. Um as with all the stuff it's, it's a work in progress but yeah we are that, that is a great idea and we will recognize that that kind of stuff as well i wanted to follow up on an idea that i saw in the chat uh about jack uh, that came from jack Pryor. Uh, apps like fish verify or fish brain that citizens use to id slash report fish that they catch it would be great to have a similar app where data could come from a public source so can you expand on, on that a little bit? You know, one of the things that Dan and uh, is specifically kind of laid out is kind of how difficult it can be to kind of gather your own data or have access to, you know, publicly available data since so much of this is kind of institutional data. So, you know, that sounds like it would be awesome, um, but, but maybe there's not a lot of that data out there or maybe I'm misunderstanding how prolific a lot of this data is available publicly and easily to access with something like that. Cool. Um, I think we need to get back to um, the main group again. Just looking at the agenda here. So we're, I think we're um, at 9.15, so it's 12.17 where I am. Kakani is gonna give um, another short little talk. So I'm gonna, we can head back out of this breakout room. We can figure out how to do that. Let's see.